Thank you very much, sir. And what General Ham uh, didn't mention, and I won't tell you, is what uniform or what colors he was wearing at the Ohio <laughs> State game. Because I was in this. Nate asked me at several events my prediction for the game, and I kept saying tie. Um, <laughs> So I maintain neutrality. I actually spent some time on the field, and I did split my time between sidelines. So that was probably one of the tougher things that I, that I did. But I didn't tell anybody what color T-shirt I had on underneath this. <laughs> and you mentioned uh, the Army G8 job, and, and people often ask me, uh, if, you know, what keeps me awake at night? And I borrowed this line from the depth sec def, former depth sec def Bob Work, and it says, I sleep like a baby. Every two hours, I wake up crying. <laughs> So I'm going to keep this fairly short because I think the most important thing is the questions. Um, and I am surprised at the size of the crowd. Uh, I don't know if it's because it's a 300th uh, breakfast or if it's because the number of former bosses and people I've worked for in the audience just idly seeing how bad I can screw this up. But Tom Horlander cleared up for me. He said it's because of the egg quiche, which is his favorite dish. So, <laughs> And I have zero slides. I am in... Uh, trying to wean myself off of PowerPoint. It says, you know, I'm probably within retirement a couple of years. So I'm gonna to try to do this with zero slides um, as I prepare to transition. And to start off, I think it's always interesting uh, what happened on this day in history. And I thought this was particularly interesting. In 1778, the Continental Congress passed the first budget of the United States on time. And there's... <laughs> There's a lot, well, I was going to say there's lots of places I could go with that, but I'm pretty sure I got some PSMs in here someplace, so I think I'll just let that one lie. In 1796, George Washington delivered his farewell address as president, and AUSA gave him more than 10 minutes at the podium. 1945, Kim Il-sung arrives in Korea as the founder and dictator of North Korea. In 1959, Nikita Khrushchev was denied entry to Disneyland. In 68, Mickey Mantle hit his 535th home run, and in 1981, uh, Tom Horlander's favorite, Simon and Garfunkel, reunited for a New York City Central Park concert. And you, you notice in the relate, you notice in relationship, you notice in relationship between the programmers and the budgeteers here, right? So it's 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 constant. Thanks again, sir, uh, for that kind invite and for that introduction, and for the opportunity to talk Army modernization today. And just like I said last year at this uh, very same time at this very same event, uh, AUSA continues to put me in a rough spot as we get ready for the annual conference, and there's some significant changes in how the Army is approaching modernization. And it's always dangerous to, to get in front of the chief and the assistant secretary, especially when I think uh, a large portion of their comments at the conference this year, the annual conference this year, will be specifically about this subject. So I see fundamentally a shift in direction, not a, not a sea change, but a shift in direction of how the Army is thinking about modernization. And everybody in this room is fully aware that the Chief's number one priority is readiness. It will remain readiness. It will always be readiness as long as he's the Chief. But part of the reason I wake up screaming every, every two hours at night is, is he has committed himself to spending more time, uh, more effort, and more time in my face over the next year or two getting after his number two priority, which includes modernization. And as you know, Secretary McCarthy, during his confirmation hearing, committed to Congress to address the Army's modernization programs, and I'm sure that Mr. Esper, if and when confirmed, will also make that same commitment. Some of you may not know, most of you probably do, that both the SASC and the HASC have asked the Army uh, or proposed for NDA language, a modernization uh, strategy, a comprehensive modernization strategy. It won't surprise many that the language is significantly different between the HASC and the SASC, and it could be due as early as December this year, depending upon when the NDA is enacted and what comes out of conference. TRADOC has the lead for that. I've talked to General Perkins several times. Uh, that effort is underway, and we are completely engaged with TRADOC to ensure that that modernization strategy addresses both the chief's and the secretary's intent and guidance. Not to mention there's new uh, guidance out from the secretary of defense uh, within the last month or so that will significantly impact program budget review this year. As most of you know, the process, the budget has been built or the program has been built uh, for probably about the last six months now. That new guidance is out and will impact review. 
and it's a long way to say it, but uh, there is a lot of changes, I think, coming. And like I said, it's not a sea change, but there is a change in the direction the Army is headed in terms of modernization, a disturbance in the force, if you will. And if pushed in the next three or four months, I intend to use all that as my get out of jail free card if anything I say today happens to change. So as of today, there's not a lot that has changed since I talked to you last year. The Army did ask for an increase in base RDA funding uh, in 18 relative to 17, which we received, we think we'll receive, to the tune of about $600 million. But as you, if you've looked at the 18 proposal, most of that, actually all of that, went to procured munitions purchases to replace uh, consumption rates and a dwindling stockpile throughout the world. The SPAR methodology, which some of you have heard me talk about, and the top 10 priorities that came out of SPAR remain the same, at least for now. And the Army is still facing what Reese McCormick called the triple whammy. Number one, modernization, procurement, and rtd &E funding are all down significantly since 2009. Number two, a lost decade of procurement. And number three, a bow wave of OSD requirements coming in the near future, for instance, the nuclear recap. And additionally, if anything, the security situation throughout the world has only gotten more complicated. Everyone in this room is fully aware of recent developments in North Korea, the major Russian exercise going on in Belarus, and the concern that's causing our NATO partners in the Baltic countries, and the SecDef's recent decision to increase the bog in Afghanistan, and that increase will almost certainly be primarily Army soldiers. And if that were not enough, it will surprise no one in this room that for the ninth year in a row, we will start the year under a continuing resolution and that once again, we face sequestration on 1 January 18 if Congress fails to act. So where does the Army go from here? As I said up front, there are a lot of unknowns right now based upon the chiefs and the secretaries and where they want to take this. However, I do have personal and professional opinions on where I personally think the Army needs to go. So number one, I'm almost certain the Army will have to continue to incrementally upgrade combat systems to ensure the U.S. Army can fight tonight against the near peer. In other words, we will have to continue to invest in incremental upgrades in order to assure that our soldiers have the best possible equipment when called. I'm almost certain that we'll have to provide greater clarity and prioritization with our S&T budget. I'm convinced that the Army should only be investing in the things that are most important to us and most likely in only the things that industry is not already heavily invested in. Number three, I think you will start to see an increased investment in prototyping of select next generation combat systems. I also think that you will see the Army try to put prototypes in the hands of soldiers as quickly as we possibly can to gather their input and their feedback, do experimentation, all before we write requirements documents. Number four, I think you'll see more desire for non-developmental like solutions that can be delivered in a rapid fashion. Much like the maneuverable shore ad demonstration, we just completed a White Sands missile range in the mobile protective firepower requirement that just completed the AOA phase and is back with OSD right now for sufficiency analysis on track uh, to deliver demonstrators next spring. I think you'll see a sustained effort. I think you'll see an effort to sustain our support fleets and combat service support fleets for as long as we possibly can to free up resources for more critical investments. And number six, and lastly, I'm almost certain you will see the Army conti continue to divest old, obsolete, and excess equipment as quickly as we possibly can in order to, once again, free up resources for higher priorities. And specifically for my team, the GA team, we have kicked off SPAR 20, as I told you we would, to inform the next Palm build. And once again, we will work through each portfolio to prioritize within that portfolio. So a one to end list within each portfolio. We will identify long-term resourcing strategies for each of the 830 programs in the Army. We will look for opportunities where we can take risk to free up resources by either canceling programs, scaling down procurement objectives. And we will look for opportunities where we can take risk in that portfolio for either higher priorities in that portfolio or as we did last year for cross portfolio trades. And new to this year, we will put together an ends, ways, and means strategy for certain critical systems, combat systems, in order to make sure that we understand exactly 
when we run out of physics, if you will, on incremental upgrades and when it, we, the Army must begin to invest in next generation systems. Key to that will be looking at the S&T uh, enabling technologies for the maturity of those technologies and really putting a timeline together to inform that decision point uh, as we have to make that decision when we transition to the next generation combat system. Because when we make that decision, the Army creates risk for itself. Because what, to do that, we will have to free up resources and to free up those resources, it has to come from the incremental upgrade uh, unless the Army's budget goes up, which I'm not expecting. So let me end by thanking AUSA and our uh, industry partners specifically for the amazing partnerships that I've seen develop over the two years that I have been the Army G8. There's no doubt the Army has some tough problems that we'll have to solve, and I have no doubt that we will not solve those problems without the partnership of industry and the partnership of AUSA, and I sincerely appreciate that partnership and every day, everything industry, AUSA, and a lot of people in this room do to support the Army uh, each and every day. So thank you very much for that, and uh, also, sir, a special thanks to you and VT Systems for supporting this breakfast this morning. And with that, I will take a few questions. Sir, our first question is over here. Okay. Good morning, sir. Brian Tate, D.C. National Guard, Deputy Director of the Joint Staff, also working force development for General George as a CACO. So we're going to have a continuing resolution on 1 October. Um, and we hear all the time that continuing resolutions, you know, are bad for the Army, they're bad for modernization, but yet we get them every year. We know the Chief said that was professional malpractice on Congress's behalf. W what would you say uh, to people that, that don't believe CRs are, are a big impact on the Army and modernization? I think uh, we're all, I actually think we're our own worst enemy uh, at some point because, as I said, this is the ninth year in a row of a continuing resolution, so we have become very adept at operating under a CR. So the real impact of the CR uh, is often not seen, as you mentioned, uh, because of that very fact, is that we actually plan on a CR. So we plan very limited new starts. Um, so I think where the biggest impact is not necessarily what most people think in terms of, of new starts, I really think it's the procurement objectives. And I think a great example of that is munitions. Um, buy for this year. So we put a significant amount of money not only in the 18 program, but also against the Chiefs UFER and in OCO funding to increase munitions buys uh, in 18. And we are stuck at 17 procurement levels, which is significantly less than the 18 what we asked for. So I think that's actually the biggest impact, uh, that and the inability to, to spend above what the authorization was in 17. Sir. Morning, sir. Um, <clears throat> you spoke last week with, with Secretary McCarthy about his approach to modernization. I'm wondering if you could share with us any of the sort of direction he may have given you on how to move out, and then also um, the timing of some of these decisions you're talking about, putting together that uh, ends, ways, and means strategy for these key programs. So I'm, I'm not going to get ahead of the Secretary. Um, so, I mean, so I gave you a little bit of a preview in, in my top six. Uh, that was basically... Um, crafted from, generally speaking, the, the conversation I've had with him. And there's been several, and they continue this week. So I think it's, a, it's an evolving story, Courtney. Uh, I don't think we're there yet. And I don't think uh, the Army can afford a drastic sea change because there, there is a lot of goodness in some continuity in programs, as most of this room can tell you. Um, but I do think we're going we're gonna to focus more time on figuring uh, what comes next. And, and I think the biggest thing that you'll see is the secretary uh, and the chief will establish a, a very strong and common narrative for the Army, which I think has been missing for a while. So I think that's kind of the focus. The, the SPAR 20 I talked about, those will go on. Uh, first out brief of, of what that is will be at the Palm Offsite in December, and then we'll continue that discussion with the chief and the acting secretary or potentially and most likely uh, if confirmed the secretary at that point in terms of, of those resources, because it is a zero-sum game. Uh, if I'm going to resource something, it has to come from someplace else. Anyone? Well, I guess you satisfied their needs. Thank you very much, sir. How about a hand for General Murray? <laughs> <laughs> 